you you come on. This is Eric Hoyle. Let's uh, introduce you first. You've been on episode three, a few episodes back, and uh, you're based in New York City. Can you describe your background uh, briefly? Yeah, sure. I'm um, I'm a scientist and a writer, but I'm also involved in the the ES community here in New York, um, and I'm particularly excited uh, because there's been just such a big upswelling of community within New York itself, um, and I think that despite the bit license. Uh, so my guess is that if you can have a lot of enthusiasm in like the most stringently regulated, uh, you know, square blocks on earth, uh, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm everywhere. I think you about summed it up. Sounds good to me. And we, uh, we have a few topics to dive into. We want to talk about Vitalik and Dan and their discussion uh, over the blogs. Go ahead yeah. and give us a little background. Yeah. Well, kind of, a recent really interesting thing that happened is that uh, Vitalik, who's um, one of the lead devs of Ethereum, uh, has been issuing kind of a string of, well, Mun might uncharitably call them attacks. I, I, I think he's very intellectually honest uh, in general and a very good person, so I, I wouldn't say that they're attacks, but they're basically, he's very skeptical of this idea of the consensus mechanism and the governance cross uh, project of, of EOS, and I think that it's very interesting because his main concern um, is something that's been a big um, kind of thing in the community, which is this notion of kickbacks and whether delegates should give kickbacks for votes and so on. And um, I, I think if you read his article, it kind of spends about two paragraphs saying, for sure kickbacks are going to happen. People will get bribed for their votes because in EOS you hold one token, you get one vote. And that this is an inherently corruptible system. And then he goes on for like two more pages to say why corruption is very bad and you don't want it in blockchains, which I don't think anyone could possibly um, disagree with. But the problem is, of course, that actually proving that any like representative token holder system will move inherently towards corruption is is impossible. And I think that it's it's very bad that we have people who are purely programmers or generally coming at it from a very purely uh, programming perspective or engineering perspective, trying to say, well, I can prove that a community will kind of operate in a certain way. And one like counter example is there are all sort, sorts of very successful, honest republics and commonwealths. And I think EOS is kind of aiming at being a republic and a commonwealth where there's uh, governing representatives and it's kind of like representational government where you have one token, one vote, you elect these block producers, and now we learn these, these legal arbiters, and they will be the people kind of making these decisions, but they can be easily and fluidly voted out. And it's very funny to me that suddenly this concept that everyone recognizes as very good in real life, which is one token, one vote in a representational democracy, is like, oh, this is inevitably going to lead to horrific corruption, and it can't possibly make any sense um, in terms of working on a blockchain or, or something like that. So so it's, it's very much people stuck in these these old models and ways of, of doing things based off of what has worked. And I don't think that they're willing to take uh, a new chance and try something a little bit more complex and I think personally a little bit more interesting. What has worked in the in, in that space, uh, in the Ethereum space there that we can take some lessons from? Well, for one thing, it's very clear that most of these chains, if you compare for example, Bitcoin to Ethereum governance, Bitcoin is basically like controlled anarchy, right? It's just, it's completely, you know, every man for himself in Bitcoin land. Um, and the protocol is set up to, to pretty much work that way. But for example, back in December, there was a reason transaction fees were 20 to $40. And that's because people couldn't settle on how to evolve the code because everything needs to be evolved. Nothing is perfect when it first comes out of the gate and everything runs into problems. So what we currently have in the, what Vitalik considers like the correct makes so much sense uh, form of governance is basically a naturally emerged form of governance that relies on uh, kind of a power struggle or at least power checking between two entities, the miners and the devs, right? And the problem is, is that this is a very, um, it's a very combative political process. It's like there's two political parties in these systems. They're always at war. Their interests are almost never aligned. And in fact, they're almost purposely not aligned. Um, versus I think with, with EOS, if, if you look at some of the stuff that Ian Gregg, uh, who 
designing some of this governance uh, processes, the governance is going to be a lot more distributed. It's going to have more checks and balances. For example, now we're hearing more about these arbiters who are going to exist on chain to kind of settle disputes and transactions. Sorry, not settle transactions, but like settle disputes over transactions or over bugs or even over whether or not a block producer or accounts did something wrong. And then if that's the case, now you have arbiters and they're going to be in some check and balance relationship to block producers. And then you have the voters voting for these various things. So you're getting something that looks a lot more like actual checks and balances and how they work in a real government. And we know that that works because it's literally what our entire society is based on. And yet, you know, we think, oh, well, no, what's better is eternal warfare between miners and devs. Like that's, <laughs> This is, this is somehow, this is going to be the superior form of a blockchain governance. And I think it's just, you know, we're, we're familiar with that. And that's the thing that Ethereum has. And it's kind of worked so far. So, um, you know, if it's not broke in their opinion, why fix it? But EOS has the chance to innovate. It's kind of like a form of collaborative competition in a way, right? It's, I mean, if you were to compare the model of governance that you're seeing emerge, we've talked about the three heads of power that Ian has also mentioned in governance chat. Um, and if you were to compare that to the United States, for example, um, to local governments, even it's pretty similar, isn't it? In some in some ways, sure, sure. And and at a you know federal level, I, I think also first of all this notion of like corruption and, and corruption being bad. It's like, well, everything in the world is corrupt to some particular degree. Like Ethereum still mines empty blocks because miners sneak them in, right? And that's kind of like a form of corruption, but obviously obviously the Ethereum chain still works relatively well. Uh, so in that sense, um, you know, there's always going to be some level of like graft, but you can just compare this um, very easily to the difference between a working representational government and a non-functional one, right? And a lot of times I think people easily conflate the two and say, well, anytime there's governance and there's people involved, there's going to be some form of corruption. And it's like, yeah, but we all know the difference between like a small, well-run township in Massachusetts, which is some commonwealth, you know, and like the corruption of, of Venezuela or something like the most corrupt government in the world. And you just walk down the street and you'll know the difference between those two things. And so, you know, like the bar that EOS needs to clear is not nothing is ever wrong. The, the bar it needs to clear is do we have a livable governance? And then what you sacrifice for that, sorry, what you gain in involving humans is that now you're protected from black swans, which is what businesses really need to be protected from in order to move their stuff on chain, because you don't know if a bug is going to take out your $200 million in your multi-sig wallet, like what happened with, with parity, right? Which is that suddenly, oh, we don't have a business anymore because all the money we had is just gone. That, that, that's happened on Ethereum several times now. So it's worth adopting a real governance, working with real people, having the minor, you know, chance of corruption to uh, inoculate yourself from any sort of black swan, such that as long as the government process is reasonably good, then you can get your money back if something goes wrong. You can use the system if something goes wrong. You can build your business with some expectation that if things go wrong, you're not completely screwed. How, how do we protect ourselves from that minor corruption that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and this is where I think people have such problems because it's not really a mathematical answer. Like it, it's not, it, it has nothing to do with exactly, what you can do is try to set the system up in such a way that you hope that two thirds of the block producers aren't gonna become immensely corrupt. You hope that people don't start buying votes. You hope that, you know, like, like all these things don't happen. And, and the way you do that is you just have a very strong community, I think, just like, any good government, like what makes good government, right? And why isn't it the case that in America, you don't get paid when you walk into a voting booth? Now we can have like, you know, kind of like a linguistic debate about do Americans ever get kickbacks for their vote? And, you know, some, some you know, Republicans and libertarians might say certain aspects of welfare are like kickbacks in a certain way, right? Yeah. But, but I think even if, the, if, even if one kind of goes down that road, it's a very like indirect form, like no one, no one in most well-functioning governments of the world get paid money to walk into a voting booth. And it's generally because 
um, they've, they've organized themselves around a constitution or around a legal system. And EOS is going to have both of those. And when you formalize the process, when you formalize all this stuff in like really direct ways, we're not just saying everyone has to be nice to one another, right? It's like, no, there's going to be a literal constitution. Everyone's going to know when you violate it. And it's going to function exactly the same as when you violate the constitution here, which is that violate the constitution in America, people will go, oh, like, how dare you? You can't do that, right? Even though it's just a piece of paper, right? So I think that's how it's going to avoid that corruption is that you're just going to build a good community using a constitution and a legal system. Uh, yeah. Thomas Cox mentioned uh, on a previous show about uh, whistleblowers uh, in this sort of mechanism uh, to, to, to outline or to highlight corruption. Uh, that as well as the arbitration process, I think that's what you're you're talking about. Are these mechanisms that are in place to to prevent these things? Right. I mean, I think what will prevent corruption fundamentally is some form of checks and balances. This is what always prevents corruption in any sort of government is some form of checks and balances. And neos, you have probably something like the legal system, like this judicial branch that's going to sit sit on EOS. You're going to have like um, the Constitution itself as kind of a founding document, and as maybe one could argue part of the judicial system. You're going to have the represent the representatives who do the voting and the action and kind of manage things. They're going to be like the elected officials, which are the delegates, right? They're going to interface with the um, with the judges, but they're not going to be the same people or anything. And then you also have the voters. So you know that structure works very well. Like the one thing we don't have there is an executive branch. But we actually do kind of have an executive branch because it's generally probably going to be the block one team with a $1 billion war chest. So economically, they're essentially functioning as the executive branch, you know, as it currently stands now. So, you know, but if they did things wrong enough, people have one token, one vote. In theory, they, they can be checked as well, right? So um, so, I, so I think that it's it's going to come down to just having this, this well thought out system. And what people haven't realized yet is that this is actually going to work in a way better way than just having, if there's a problem, we hard fork. If there's a disagreement, we hard fork. Yeah. If I can get everyone to agree and the devs and the miners to agree, we might do something. Right. And, and also the other uh, concept as mentioned before, if you put your private key on a table and someone else grabs it, that doesn't mean it's yours, right? So we, we can enforce things like that as well. Yes, and, and that's a big reason why people will actually keep money on the chain. So, you know, if you want to talk about store of value, well, one aspect of store of value is that um, there, you're not at risk of losing all your value very, very quickly and easily, right? Um, so I think Bitcoin will eventually overcome this because the technology will get so good in terms of the multi-sig wallets and that sort of technology that if your entry into the chain is secure enough you know, you might eventually be able to overcome it, but EOS will overcome it much, much faster in that you can just go to petition, you know, especially if you're like a big DAP. If you're the Facebook of EOS, right, you're not worried about having your business on EOS because you're a big voice in the community. Anything goes wrong, you're going to be able to talk to the block producers, et cetera. People need that. Like, they fundamentally need that. This is why I, I like talking to you, Eric, because you just get more, as you dive into a point, you get more and more fired up. And I love it. It's just, <laughs> I get really into it too. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Tell Do me. we have a brief moment to talk about the inter-chain uh, communication that was brought up earlier? Yeah, I was about to bring it up too. It, it, you're talking about the one token to rule them all. And we don't really know a whole lot about it yet, but the inter-blockchain communication and Dan and Brendan both were talking about one token ruling those chains. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, this is part of a pattern of the block one team, which is that, like, I'm watching them develop this, and then I come up with some objection about why, oh, this is going to be like a problem, right? And but the very first one was, you know, why, what's going to uh, make there be a main chain that respects the token distribution, right? And then they don't say, and then eventually they announce, oh, there's a billion dollar war chest and we're only going to be developing on the main chain and the billion dollar war chest is only for the main chain. So it's like, okay, so sign me onto the main chain, which is obviously going to be a main chain because there's so much economic gravity, right? So they had kind of like already thought that, but they hadn't told us. Right? So, um, you know, one of the big concerns has been that if EOS 
caps out at a certain upper limit of, of transactions per second or a certain amount of storage, then people will just start spinning up like other EOS chains because it doesn't cost too much, at least in theory, to spin up a new chain, right? And so you can imagine this kind of creates this diminishing return value where it's like, well, you know, if my, if my value of my EOS token that I hold is my rights in terms of voting and my access to property that is in terms of the transactions and the storage on the blockchain, if you can just create new blockchains like ad infinitum, then what is the actual value of my token, right? And in fact, if we're gonna need to create new blockchains to, to handle the scales of which people are kind of developing for, then it's even it's worth even less, right? It's like I have it's like I have a deed to Manhattan real estate, but you can press a button and you get another Manhattan, right? And it's like, okay, so your Manhattan real estate is worth nothing, actually. But it turns out, I think that this has been known all along. And the idea is now that there'll be, there's this old notion of like side chains or, or peg chains, and there's something kind of similar going on. But what's going to happen is that the governance in the form of the voters, who are the token holders, and then also the way that those, what those tokens represent, which are the transactions and the storage, those will all be the same distribution of people. And then when you spin up like a new EOS chain, what will happen is that all the same rights and resources will now apply to that chain. And therefore you can just kind of scale indefinitely. And it's kind of like, yeah, I can make a new Manhattan, but everyone who has the deed to the buildings there now has the deed to the buildings on the new mirror Manhattan that I just like spun up, right? And that the political governance process doesn't change across the different real estates that I spin up, right? So everything is orthogonal. So I think that this, I've been waiting to hear something about this for like a while. And I think it's directly now confirmed from Brendan. And this is something that people miss in the announcement, which is that holding single EOS tokens will basically allow you to participate in the governance and resources of all the EOS chains that are spun off off of the main chain. Where did you think this need came from? Like, is this something that was needed in, in a prior DPoS chain? Mm. I think that one reason is that eventually this is going to uh, tap out at a certain amount. I mean, so, so the need to having multiple chains and the ability uh, of the, the token to kind of govern over them, it's, it's like a very easy and viable form of scaling, right? You just double what you've done, right? And then you have the same delegates or block producers uh, work over the chain. They know what they're doing. They've already been elected and so on. So you capture the network effect. But in terms of the need, my guess is that each EOS chain is going to tap out maybe 100, at most like 100,000 transactions per second. You're okay. going to need to spin up more. It's a resourcing thing. Yeah, it's just, it's just that, you know, if we want a million transactions per second, what you want is a million transactions per second, but you still own the same percentage of the bandwidth and you still have the same voters and you still have the same thing, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's just crazy to me that you have something like Ethereum and what is Ether? Like Ether is just a gas that you burn for the microtransactions on the network. And everyone like goes crazy for this thing. You just use it to do one thing. It has one utility, which is you just burn it and you only need a tiny bit. You can, you can, burn it, you can buy it as you burn it. Like you don't even need to hoard a bunch of it. You can just buy it as you burn it, right? And then EOS has like, I don't know, at this point, like five different utilities, voting, like participating in the government's voting, you can lock it up for storage, you can lock it up for RAM, you can lock it up to rent, you can rent it itself, you can lock it up for, for transactions. You need it to do certain things on the network. And now it's gonna be the same token is also gonna have the same five utilities on like every other EOS chain that gets spun up probably um, that if you need to scale and it's just really funny to me that like the market hasn't figured out that the thing that you want is like the token that has all the utility like you want it to have the most possible utilities and we just got told that this one token is not just governing the utilities of this chain it's also going to literally govern the utilities of future chains as well it's crazy right? yeah I think the word cryptocurrency is an insult to EOS in my mind. <laughs> good point <laughs> Maybe I, I, I like the term cryptocurrency, but it's like uh, crypto real estate or something. It's like very economically a whole new crypto state, uh, possibly, you know, eventually. Well, Eric, it was great having you on. Yes. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. We always enjoy talking to you. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah, for, for sure. Very much enjoying the show.
Okay. Thanks. We'll, Thank we'll you. see you soon. Bye, gentlemen. Bye.